Hi, this is Austin Scott, and uh, this is five quick wins for improving your ICS cybersecurity posture. I'm a principal industrial penetration tester as part of the Dragos professional services team. And uh, I really see the world from the perspective as a, a pen tester, just like a hammer sees the world as a nail. I, I really see everything from an adversarial perspective. And uh, that's the point of view we'll be taking in this presentation today. Um, really, we're looking for ways to make it more difficult for an adversary to move through an ICS environment. Now, my recommendations in and of themselves won't give you a bulletproof cybersecurity program or industrial cybersecurity program, but uh, they will raise the bar for your security posture. Of course, there's a lot of other things involved in running an industrial cybersecurity program that are outside of the scope of this presentation. But in my presentation today, we're going to talk about a lot of the common things that as an industrial penetration tester, as a, an industrial cybersecurity assessment um, practitioner, these are the things that we see over and over again. And a lot of them can be addressed uh, fairly easily uh, without a lot of uh, capital or operational expenditure. So we'll talk about how to uh, address some of these risks and what these, these common uh, issues that we identify are. Uh, so a lot of this is based on the 2019 Dragos Year in Review report. We see a lot of these common issues as we do assessment after assessment. Uh, it's common to see things like limited visibility or credentials laying around or routable connections from your corporate environment into the ICS environment and um, even uh, ICS components directly accessible from the internet these days. So uh, a lot of these common findings are highlighted in this year in review report. And we'll be talking about the top five and how to really uh, address those or identify them in your own environment and uh, remediate them. So we think it's important to take a threat-based approach when you're um, when you're looking at risk in your industrial cybersecurity environment. Uh, now within uh, Dragos, we track a number of activity groups that uh, target these environments. And this will be really done from the perspective of our own internal uh, internal activity group called Kyberite, where um, we develop our ICS tactics and techniques, uh, really based on a lot of the other activity groups that we see. So we try to do some, some threat emulation as we're working through these networks and use a lot of the common a lot of the common techniques that we see being used against ICS environments. And uh, of course, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures are, are part of the equation, but uh, th we find these really change depending on the environment that you have. And it's important to, um, of course, start with understanding what you have whether you're running Windows uh, Active Directory or Windows Workgroup, what kind of security controls you have, how the internet access works, how industrial uh, vendors get in, what your firewall rules look like. Once you understand these basic uh, environmental factors uh, and understand how they change the tactics and techniques of an activity group, uh, that can really help you reduce your risk and understand where you need to invest your time and energy to uh, mitigate some of these risks. Um, of course, if you if you study activity groups like Electrum and Xenotime, there are uh, publicly known techniques that they have used against uh, environments. And I, I, I certainly believe those techniques would change depending on what was available. Uh, as a pen tester, as an adversary, we're always very dynamic with our approach. We need to um, roll with the punches and adjust our techniques to align with the environment we're faced with. So that's why um, it's not one size fits all. You can't take all these TTPs that are identified and um, directly apply them to your environment necessarily. Uh, the, uh, often the environment dictates what the TTPs uh, are, are gonna be used, which TTPs are gonna be used. So during this presentation, we'll be talking about our top five ICS assessment findings for 2019. And these are related to firewall rules, access management, system hardening, logging, and network visibility. So we'll be talking about some of the tools that we use as penetration testers and ICS network uh, assessment professionals 
some of the tools that can be used safely in ICS environments without introducing uh, operational risk or very, at the very least, uh, minimal operational risk when they are being uh, leveraged in these environments. How to identify these risks using these tools and then also how to mitigate some of these uh, common findings. So at the end of the day, if you're able to take ownership of your industrial cybersecurity posture, uh, do some self-assessment work. Uh, it's not difficult to do once you understand what tools are available and, and um, uh, how to approach some of these problems at, and highlight some of these problems. If you're able to mitigate a lot of these common issues, even prior to doing another assessment, it allows that red team or that penetration testing team or that assessment team to really focus on the more interesting problems. So you're getting rid of all the low hanging fruit. So the um, adversary group has to dig a lot deeper and uh, focus on uh, some of the uh, more challenging problems. Um, and you're also raising the bar. Like when you, when you address a lot of these low hanging fruit, uh, a lot of these low level issues, it really reduces the playbook that the adversary can, uh, can use. Uh, they're not able to fall back on their normal, uh, normal operating plans. They need to think outside the box a little more. They need to experiment more, do more reconnaissance. And whenever they do that, when they have to work harder, uh, you have more opportunities to detect them. You have more opportunities to stop them. And, uh, and also you make their lives a lot more difficult, which is, you know, something you want to do. You want these, these adversaries who are targeting critical infrastructure, who are trying to turn the lights off in your, in your town or, or impact uh, these uh, important industrial processes. You want them to have to lay in bed at night, questioning their life choices that brought them to that uh, position uh, of why they're targeting civilian infrastructure. So starting off with firewall rules, what we see when we uh, do these assessments, often we'll ask for the, uh, the rules to be shared with us. Uh, usually like a white box approach is best. Uh, when we're doing ICS assessments, uh, we, we really need to be transparent with the operating operators at the sites and the, the site personnel. Turns out uh, industrial asset owners and industrial operators don't like surprises. So uh, we found that it's, it's very important to be open and clear with what we're doing whenever we're doing it within these ICS assessments. Um, the more information we can share, uh, the more we can um, work closely with the operations team and start to build that trust and, and that uh, build that bridge between um, the uh, cybersecurity team and the OT or the ICS operations team, which is, which is so important to be uh, successful in this environment. So when we ask for these firewall rules, we'll usually use a tool to make sense of them. Uh, there's dozens of different firewalls out there and they all provide their rules in different formats. Uh, fortunately, there are some commercial tools that you can use and even some free tools you can use to make sense of these rules and work through them in more of an Excel spreadsheet kind of format. One uh, free tool we like to use is the SolarWinds free firewall browser. Uh, so what you can do is export your firewall rules and then import them using this SolarWinds free firewall browser and uh, then just go kind of line by line. Uh, what you're really looking for is um, interactive protocols that allow um, remote access between your different trust zones. So typically between your corporate network and your ICS network or even between different trust zones within the ICS network. Uh, you're looking for SSH, Telnet, remote desktop, VNC, even things like WMI or um, remote management, RPC, SMB, even protocols like OPC, like OPC DA, the older OPC protocols uh, can allow remote access uh, and often do. So we often find there are temporary firewall rules still in these uh, configurations from uh, the time of commissioning. We find there's vendor dictated rules and vendor access rules that have never really been evaluated or, or questioned. 
So it's important to go line by line and, and really question why do we have this? Like what, what purpose does it serve? Who's using this? And to knock off as many of those temporary or um, vendor dictated rules as you can. Of course, you want to communicate with your vendor if that vendor is using that for remote access. You want to uh, identify those and um, make sure they are still able to access or maybe propose a more secure method if, uh, if the method that you're using is, uh, is uh, introducing risk in your environment. So this is what the free firewall browser looks like. It just uh, breaks down the rules line by line in sort of an Excel spreadsheet format. And you can see we've got a couple interesting interactive rules here on 3389, which is the uh, remote desktop protocol. So things to watch out for when you're going through these uh, assessments. There's commercial tools you can use as well, like Nipper, that can help you identify uh, issues. Often we still find any any rules or what's equivalent to any any rules. Sometimes these firewall rules can get quite complicated and um, you put enough rules overlapping on top of each other and it, it can basically equate to an any any rule. So it's important to study these firewall rules closely and identify um, opportunities to pivot through these different trust zones. Now, another common issue that we uh, run into is access management. And what we really find is it's not necessary uh, most of the time to use any exploits or have, have to um, uh, dig too deep in these ICS networks for um, to pivot or escalate privilege because the access management is so poor in these environments often uh, we'll run into um, shared Active Directory environments between corporate and the ICS. So once we, uh, once we take that corporate uh, Active Directory environment, we're able to easily pivot and take full control over the ICS environment. Other situations where there is a dedicated Active Directory environment in the ICS, it's poorly maintained and hasn't really been uh, configured properly. So Usually we see almost everybody's a domain admin or there's lots of service accounts that are domain admins. Lots of these common issues in Active Directory uh, that we run into. So what, what do you do? How do you identify these issues? Well, what we typically do is run a tool called Bloodhound. Now it's a free open source tool uh, and it's been used, it's used by pen testing teams and red teams to um, unravel the yarn ball that is Active Directory. For years, Active Directory kind of uh, experienced this security through obscurity where it's so complicated that even the adversaries couldn't really figure out all of the groups and groups and users and groups and how all those unwind to different permission levels. But with the introduction of Bloodhound, this, uh, this tool uses graph theory to, um, to really map out what the implications of all these permissions are, what um, how to unravel all these groups to determine who's really a domain admin and, and how you can pivot from the average user to domain admin uh, fairly easily. So it shows you all these different paths and overprivileged accounts that you can identify and potentially lock down. And it's fairly safe to, there's a very low operational risk because it only communicates with the Active Directory server in the network. It's not gonna scan your network or hit all the PLCs in, in your network or anything like that. It's only gonna communicate with the Active Directory environment and it's only going to send LDAP requests which are fairly normal. It's just the same kind of network activity that you would introduce if you were logging into a machine or uh, remote desktoping into a machine. It's, uh, it's nothing unusual for that environment. There's certainly a big spike of LDAP when you, um, uh, when you use that tool but it's nothing that would create an operational risk in that environment. So what does, uh, what does that look like? So here's an example of Bloodhound uh, unraveling a path to the domain admin from this RTAM user. We can see he's a, a member of this group that's an administrator on this machine. And because they're an admin on this machine, um, they're able to uh, gain access to potentially the, uh, the password or the hash of this user who is also logged into this machine and then use that user's privilege to um, gain domain administrator access in that network. 
So this can really make sense of Active Directory and help identify some of those common issues that, uh, and common misconfigurations. So access management part two. So what if you don't have Active Directory? What if, what if it's a Windows workgroup environment, which is also fairly common to see in ICS? And even if, even if uh, you do have Active Directory, there's other passwords that exist outside of Active Directory within these ICS networks. So I'm talking about things like VNC and SSH, credentials into switchgear, network gear, um, stuff like that. There's usually passwords just laying around the network and Excel spreadsheets or notepad files or uh, default credentials for a lot of devices. Often we find credentials are stored in things like Chrome or stored in things like PuTTY or WinSCP or Batch Patch or other, other tools like that. And when you, when you click that option to save your username and password in these tools, these tools don't always securely manage those credentials. So it can be quite trivial for an attacker to pull out those stored credentials. Uh, so what you can do is leverage some of these um, client side tools like Session Gopher that are free, uh, Session Gopher from FireEye or uh, even performing things like an LSAS dump or using tools like Mimikatz, Mimikittens and some of these NERSoft password utils. Now Mimikatz is it's something that's used by almost every activity group. Once, uh, once these activity groups get a foothold in an environment, one of the first things they do is dump their um, post exploitation tools. A lot of those are just trying to find passwords uh, to escalate privilege and move laterally in that environment. So you want to try to understand how you're storing your passwords, what's, what passwords are stored on different endpoints. And you can automate that process, just like the activity groups typically do. Uh, so what, what can you do once you've identified uh, the issues or uh, the mis storage of passwords, you can implement uh, some kind of password storage mechanism like a, or a, a privilege access management system or, or even just like a vault like or a last pass or, or some um, password vault solution that does a better job protecting these, these uh, important credentials than um, WinSCP or PuTTY or other tools typically do. So here's a quick example of uh, running Mimikatz. And it's something I'd recommend, like uh, it's, it's something we always try to do on a safe environment, uh, running Mimikatz to, just to see if it's detected, if it, if it's triggers, any kind of alerts, if we're able to do uh, like what we're doing here, dump um, the LSAS memory. Uh, to a file. So uh, if we dump the LSAS memory using the task manager, just uh, right click on the um, uh, local security authority process and go create dump file, we can copy that dump file off of the machine and run it through Mimikatz to see what kind of passwords we pull out of memory. If your uh, Windows endpoints are not hardened, you'll usually be able to pull out um, the uh, hashes and uh, often clear text passwords from any account that has recently logged into that machine. So it can be quite eye-opening to, uh, to see that and see these passwords coming through in clear text uh, using Mimikatz. So it's something we, we recommend that um, our customers do in a safe, and safe uh, manner. Uh, and even just copying the um, Mimikatz executable into one of your ICS assets just to see if it gets caught by Windows Defender or Norton AV and, and to see if that alert makes it someplace to see if uh, you know the uh, your monitoring uh, is set up properly. Uh, it should create alerts. It should set off all kinds of alarm bells. So it's a great way of testing your, um, your monitoring for uh, uh, malicious files in your ICS network. Here's another example of uh, another tool, the, the FireEye Session Gopher. It looks for passwords and other tools like WinSCP and PuTTY and um, RDP, like your stored passwords in your remote desktop client. Uh, so it'll pull out clear passwords like we see in this example below. And this can be very valuable to an adversary who's looking to move laterally or escalate their privilege in the network. And we almost always, always find credentials when we're doing these assessments uh, one way or another. There's, there's always 
uh, almost always poor storage of these credentials. So another thing that can help address that credential storage issue is uh, some basic Windows system hardening. It's a very common issue that we see where a lot of these ICS Windows assets, they, they haven't performed any hardening. Often we find things like the firewall is completely turned off on these Windows endpoints um, just because uh, these ICS networks are so uh, sensitive at times. Once, once the operators or the, the system integrators get things working, they're afraid to change anything or lock anything down in case it breaks something. So uh, usually once they get things working, they just kind of leave it as is. And uh, it's, it's rare to find any system hardening really performed. And, and uh, without, without some basic Windows system hardening, it's, it's so easy to cut through those networks as an adversary. Um, the default Windows installation, especially Windows 7 and older Windows versions, um, there's just so many, uh, so many backwards compatibility features that are turned on that make it so easy to pull passwords, escalate privilege to a system. Uh, that um, once you're in that network, you can own it uh, within a matter of minutes without some system hardening happening. Oops, uh, it looks like my internet connection had a bit of a blip there. I'll start that over. Uh, now, system hardening does have the potential to create an operational or introduce operational risk. You'll need to work closely with your vendor to ensure that any hardening you're doing won't impact your operating process. Often, the major vendors will have system hardening guides that you can follow, uh, and um, the recommended hardening that um, uh, that they have tested and approved. So it, it's important when you're building a new greenfield system, when you're building an ICS system from the ground up to ask them to implement these uh, system hardening features to turn security on. Because uh, what we find is if you don't ask the vendors or the system integrators to do these things, it just doesn't, doesn't happen. Uh, if you don't set that standard or, or, or make that request, uh, they're just, they're not gonna do it. Uh, so it's very important to be clear that you want the, the systems hardened uh, they need to be part of their commissioning plan, uh, part of their uh, site acceptance testing or factory acceptance testing checklist that these um, hardening uh, features are turned on and the recommended best practices for system hardening for that vendor have been implemented. And uh, if the vendor does not, if they're not very mature and they don't have a uh, hardening guide, um, you, can, uh, you can use some of the tools like uh, some of the ones I've listed here, like CHAPS, the Configuration Hardening uh, Assessment uh, PowerShell script from Cutaway Security to identify some of the common hardening issues. And uh, you can raise those up with the vendor to get them approved or ensure that uh, the, they're on board with making these changes. But there's other tools. Microsoft has a great tool called the Security Compliance Toolkit, which does a very thorough analysis. It does require you to install some software in your ICS environment, so that could cause some issues with uh, your vendors. Same with the CIS tools and the STIG tools. They do require software to be installed in order to make them work. Uh, but that's why I love the CHAPS tool. It's just a PowerShell script you can run. It doesn't require any software to be installed. It just will do some data collection on that uh, endpoint and uh, highlight some of these common hardening issues. So again, you have to work closely with the vendor when you're running these things. But here's an example of the CHAPS hardening demo in action. Uh, you can just run it uh, as a PowerShell command like I've done above. And then it gives you sort of a pass fail view, things like W Digest, DNS client. This, if you implement these uh, hardening recommendations, it will prevent an adversary from being able to pull clear text passwords out of memory, clear hashes uh, out of memory. Uh, it'll prevent them from downgrading to PowerShell 2 and bypassing a lot of the PowerShell security features. 
So it, it, um, it also helps reduce the chances of man in the middle attacks and things like that in your ICS network. So just a, a little bit of hardening and lockdown can have a huge impact. So um, what we're seeing from um, a logging perspective is usually a complete lack of logging or no centralized logging. Sometimes logging is turned on on the Windows endpoints, but it's just not going anywhere. It's just being stored locally. Uh, and if it is turned on and being centrally managed, they're not always logging the right stuff in these ICS environments. Uh, they're not logging PowerShell commands or, or new processes. They're not using things like Sysmon to really get the, um, the details you need to do proper forensic analysis and incident response in these environments. And it's not hard to do. It's, it's not difficult to turn these, um, these things on. Uh, and again, that CHAPS tool can help you identify some of the common uh, logging issues that you may uh, uh, encounter and some of the things you'll want to turn on in your um, ICS environments. And really just having that centrally managed logging environment can be such a, a huge win. Uh, if you ever are doing like an incident response, you'll be so grateful to have that centrally managed logging environment. And it's all built into Windows. You don't need to have Splunk or anything like that. You can just use Windows event forwarding to uh, centrally manage those, those Windows events without having to spend any extra money. Just having that, those events all in one place can uh, really facilitate things like threat hunting and uh, can speed up incident response uh, and give you better visibility into your ICS network as well. So what we recommend is um, understanding what your Windows event logging capabilities are today, what's being logged, what's not being logged, where is it going? And uh, using, again, that CHAPS tool can help identify these issues. There's really a pretty low operational risk. It may produce a little more traffic on your network, but um, for most modern networks, this shouldn't be uh, a huge issue. Now here's the output of a CHAPS tool again, that PowerShell script, and um, it can show you uh, some of the issues if you have the PowerShell task scheduler, WinRM, WMI activity, all these different uh, log files are uh, important to have turned on and have a, a larger log size uh, and ensure that they're being forwarded to a central location. So the CHAPS tool can help identify a lot of these common issues. Uh, so if you turn on the recommended logging uh, from CHAPS, it, it will make a big difference and, and reduce your risk quite a bit. Now onto network visibility. Another common issue that we see is uh, as a pen test or, or a red team, we're able to operate within these ICS networks undetected. Uh, once we're in them, there's usually very little or, or no visibility, so we can move about uh, move laterally, escalate privilege, take over the domain without any alarm bells going off and maintain perpetual access as well. Uh, so what you can, uh, what you can do is um, if you don't have network visibility today, you can start to lay that foundation and start to uh, see if you get the value out of it uh, in um, a low cost sort of introductory kind of uh, method. Uh, First of all, if you just identify the points in your network that you should be monitoring, what switches you should be uh, attaching or configuring span ports to, or better yet, purchase some network taps and, and install them. And just having those, just having those points in your network that you can tap into to collect data and collect PCAPs, uh, it's extremely valuable in, in an incident response, or it's extremely valuable in uh, a threat hunting exercise. So that can really enable your security operations team to, um, to do a lot more, just, just knowing where to plug in. Uh, that's the first step in getting that network visibility. And once you have that, you can start to collect PCAPs and do some analysis to, to better understand what's going on, what kind of traffic you see in your network, what's normal. Uh, and then you can start to use some, even some free tools that are available uh, or commercial tools to perform analysis on those PCAPs or even install some hardware and software to do continuous monitoring uh, of that uh, network traffic. And again, it's a pretty low operational risk. 
uh, you're connecting to span ports um, or taps. Now, ideally, we always recommend you'd use dedicated taps, network taps, rather than span ports. Um, span ports, when they're configured on a switch, there is a risk that that switch can get kind of overloaded, especially if it's an older piece of equipment. Uh, you should be monitoring the CPU usage of those switches once you enable your span port. If they're in the 80 or 90% utilization um, kind of threshold, you may want to uh, consider an alternate option because that could just put it over the edge and um, create a network outage. So you need to, need to be a little careful with that, but it shouldn't, it typically doesn't cause too many uh, issues. Um, uh, to uh, set up those those span ports, but in some of the edge cases, it could create some or introduce some operational risk. So something to be aware of, something to watch. And of course, having visibility into your network can improve your threat detection and threat moderate monitoring capability with the right uh, tools and techniques and procedures. So there are two, uh, three products that Dragos uh, provides. One of the free products is our old CyberLens product, uh, which is, it's well suited for PCAP analysis. It, it was really designed to just uh, take a PCAP and help visualize what's inside, uh, specific to the ICS protocols and ICS content. It's, it's a great way to help you understand what assets are in your network. That's a common challenge we see in the ICS space. What do I have? What are my, what's on my network at any given time? So CyberLens can help you identify those. Uh, and Sophia is designed for more of the continuous um, monitoring. Sophia was the uh, next defense product that was commercially sold to customers all around the world. And now it's available for free um, from the Dragos website. So if you want just continuous asset identification, uh, monitoring just to know what's on your network and, and have that updated perpetually, Sophia is a great tool for doing that. And of course, there's commercial tools you can use uh, like Network Miner to do uh, analysis of PCAPs. That's a very handy uh, tool for uh, digging into PCAP data. And of course, the, the Dragos platform is our commercial product that does a, a threat-based um, monitoring of ICS networks with uh, playbooks and um, uh, feeds into our Intel uh, with the latest uh, activity groups that are targeting these uh, environments. So if you want, if you're ready, if you're seeing the value in your uh, network monitoring, then um, maybe a commercial product is, uh, is the next step for you. But it's always nice to kind of learn to um, walk before you run, kind of identify those span ports and kind of ease your way into it um, to, to make sure you really see the value of, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and take full advantage of that value of uh, uh, OT network monitoring. And of course, this is something, these self-checks, these um, common self-assessments can be done regularly. Uh, and uh, there's, there's huge benefits to taking ownership of these. Just doing like uh, some mini assessments once a year, once every six months, just to see what's on your network, look at how passwords are stored, understand who the big, um, uh, the big accounts in your Active Directory environment are, who the domain admins are and who has access to that. All these things uh, should be done regularly. Once you really take ownership of your industrial cybersecurity, of your industrial cyber risk, you can, um, you can make a big difference in that risk reduction. You can start to uh, address that. And it's something that should be done on a regular basis uh, at a set interval once a year, once every six months, because ICS environments are quite dynamic. They do change. Um, they're constantly being uh, modified and updated and, and maintained. So uh, it's good to do this on a regular basis and it can be augmented. Once you, once you get into this self-check and you're, you're covering off a lot of the low hanging fruit, that's, that's when you can bring in uh, a professional team to do an assessment and then they'll get to really dig into the interesting stuff. Uh, the stuff that uh, is um, uncommon and uh, would require an adversary to dig a little deeper, do more research and, um, have to sweat a little to, to move through your network. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for attending.